This is the solution to exercise 6, problem set 1. Here we're doing some simple proofs, some geometric proof and some algebraic proofs. And we start off by part A, where we have two twofold rotational axes perpendicular to each other. And we can say without loss of generality, we can put one of them to be C2x and the other one to be C2y. The question is now, is there a rotational axis z to z? We can answer this question by constructing the most general 3D geometric object which we can create by mapping one point with all possible combinations of our symmetry operations. So we've got an x component, a y component, an x component, and a z component for this point x. And we, if we map it by c to y, it gets mapped over here. If we map it by C2x, it gets mapped over here. And if we take either this or this point as the original point for another mapping, we arrive over here. Obviously, this structure, 3D structure containing these four points, obey this C2z symmetry. So we've got that axis. In part B, we take an n-fold rotational principal axis with a two-fold rotational axis inclined by an angle alpha to it, where alpha is not equal to plus minus pi half, meaning it's not perpendicular to Cn. So we take now Cn and C2 alpha as a set of symmetry operations, and we have to show that this is not a group. And it's easy to show, because let's take let's take the combination of both elements. Let's say we have one element on the Cn axis, then we map it with the C2 alpha, and we arrive over here, and then we map it again with Cn, and we arrive somewhere around this circle. Let's say here or here or here, not here, but in any any way we can map it. We can, can't reach this point without going the same way as before, meaning we have no element in this group mapping from here to, let's say, there directly. This violates our, our group property, saying Cn combined with C2 alpha, or the other way around, is not in G. Therefore, G is not a group. In part C of problem 6, we're asked to look uh, a little closer to left and right identities. So we write down the definitions again. For the definition for the right identities over here, if we right multiply e bar to a, a doesn't change. And if we left multiply e prime to a, a doesn't change. So in any way, we're allowed to write e prime, a, e bar, equal to a, and now we make a useful choice, namely we set a to e bar, and this equation reduces to e prime e e equal to e bar, and this is equivalent to saying e prime is equal to e bar. In part d of our exercise, we take a look at the left and the right inverse. So if we have a group element g and we take the right inverse, we right multiply g bar and arrive at the identity element. Or if we take the uh, left inverse g prime and left multiply it with g, we arrive at the identity element. This proof can be done with a single line. We have g prime and we insert an identity here. This identity can be written as g g bar. So here we use this kind of definition. Now we use the associativity to regroup our elements. Then we use this definition again to say this is nothing else than g bar. And we've shown that the left identity is equal to the right identity. 
In E, we are wanna we're investigating a group element consisting of multiple other group elements, and we wanna give a handy handy uh, expression for its inverse. So, what do we wanna know? First, it's always good to write down the definition to s and work on from there. So we write down the definition for the inverse of this element to the minus one is equal to the identity. We can't open this bracket because this is a new unknown element. But here we are allowed by associativity to open this bracket and when we, for example, left multiply with g1 to the minus one, we can extract out an identity. In this way we can extract out many identities in fact. In fact, n identities, if we left multiply these elements to this equation. So I'll write that down again. We have gn to the minus 1 times dot 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 times g1 to the minus 1 times our original element times its inverse is equal to, to gn to the minus 1 to g1 to the minus 1. Now we see here, as we've seen before, this is the identity and then this element can be left out. Now we've got t g2 the, to the minus 1 times g2, this is an identity again, and we can do that n times and have n identities. So in fact we're left with the expression for g1 to gn to the minus 1, this is namely gn to the minus 1 times g1 to the minus 1 f is left out, now we move to g. In g we have a function depending on a group, el acting on a group element g and this is a left multiplication by a. We have to show that this function acting on a group element is a bijective map. Bijectiveness, as you remember from analysis, means injectiveness plus surjectiveness. First we want to show injectiveness. We say if we have, if we apply fa to two different group elements g and g prime and those match, g and g prime must match. So what does this equation imply? This equation implies that a g equals to a g prime. Now if, if we left multiply with a to the minus one, which we are allowed because there is such an element in the group, we arrive at g equal g prime and we showed injectiveness. The surjectiveness can be shown uh, similarly. We have fa of g and we say this uh, is an element s. And the rearrangement theorem allows us to write s as a times g. So we've shown there's a unique element g which can be traced back to the resulting element s. Injectiveness and surjectiveness again implies bijectiveness, so we've shown that this map is bijective. Thank you for watching, see you next time.